Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 130 of the Ortho Eval Pal podcast. I am your host, Paul Markey, and today with me I have special guest, Dr. Eric Hoffman, and we're going to be talking about ACL injuries, some tips and tricks to manage these, and much more. Now, we could talk all day long about ACL injuries. I do seven, eight hour lectures on knee injuries, and I can just go on and on and on forever. But what I'd like to do today is really connect the surgical repair of ACLs to the rehab with pearls and pointers that make sense for us as practitioners to be able to utilize in our clinics. Now, I don't want to get too technical today, um, but I do want to increase your understanding of how to manage ACL injuries uh, on a few different levels. But before we get started, I'd like to take a word to hear, um, like to take a moment to hear a word from our sponsors. Welcome back. So with me today, I have Dr. Eric Hoffman. Um, Dr. Hoffman is a board certified uh, specialist uh, in orthopedic sports medicine. He specializes in arthroscopic treatment of the knee and shoulder, and uh, he has been with the Orthopedic Associates since 1998. Um, he's on the American Board of Orthopedic Surgeons and has a certificate in orthopedic sports medicine. He also um, has a uh, is part of the Arthroscopic Association of North America, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, the Maine Society of Orthopedic Surgeons, and the Piedmont Orthopedic Society. Uh, he also received his Bachelor's of Science at um, University of Washington and uh, went to Duke University School of Medicine and Duke University also did his residency there uh, in orthopedic surgery. Also went to uh, Carolina Orthopedic uh, Research Foundation, where he received his fellowship uh, training, and he is also the team physician for the Falmouth High School in Falmouth, Maine, and is a consultant for Sunday River Ski Resort. He is also the supporting physician for the Portland Pirates AHL Hockey Club, and is an Ironman Lake Placid Triathlon finisher. He also enjoys skiing, mountain biking, running, kiteboarding, and family time. Dr. Hoffman, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for the introduction. Well, I have a million questions for you today, but I thought we would uh, get started with some relatively simple ones and just start working on, you know, several topics from there. Um, you know, what can you tell us about, you know, ACLs and the treatment of ACLs and how it's changed over the last 10 to 15 years? I know it's been dramatic in regards to how we do physical therapy and things have kind of come, you know, around and, and what we used to do 15 20 years ago, some of that is starting to come back now. Tell me uh, from, from your experience how things have changed. Yeah, so there have been quite a few changes, you know, particularly in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, I think I've listed a four or five different changes that I think are kind of hallmark. Um, I think we're doing a lot more ACL surgery than we were before. Um, it seemed back when I started 15, 20 years ago, um, that ACLs were done mostly just in the athletic population. And so that left a lot of unstable knees and people with activities of daily living and moving around. So, you know, we're having a lower threshold to recommend surgery for quality of life and, to prevent, you know, to prevent meniscus injuries and other things. So um, definitely more are treated surgically than not. Um, uh, uh, and that's been a trend that's been increasing. Um, there is more of an anatomic approach. So used to be that we wanted to get the graft at, uh, you know, on the femoral side around the one o'clock or 11 o'clock position to, you know, get more of a vertical stabilization. But uh, with some you know, anatomic studies, um, people have been putting the graft much more anatomic down at the two o'clock or the 10 o'clock or even the 2.30 and 9.30 positions on the clock face, so to speak, on the femoral side. And that's providing a much better rotational stability, not just the AP uh, dimension, but also rotational stability. And um, one of the ways to do that is with what's called the footprint, footprint technique. And um, that's use of what's called the anterior medial portal. And so instead of doing what's called transtibial technique, where, we, where you're dependent upon the angle of the tibial tunnel to, to drill the femoral tunnel, you're actually drilling the femoral tunnel through a portal. So it gives you more flexibility to place the femoral tunnel wherever you want to. So you can put it down at that two o'clock or 2.30 position um, at the anatomic footprint. Um, and so adapting that to my practice probably 10 or 12 years ago, I've seen a, so what I think is a big difference in earlier, you know, easier range of motion, more isometric position of the knee, um, and uh, I think improved outcomes. Um, and I've seen a lot more um, 
improvement in meniscal preservation. So, um, you know, particularly as there's more awareness about the importance of the meniscus and repair and other techniques that we can do to save that meniscus, uh, there's been a big push to preserve the meniscus. And I think that's important, um, you know, with ACL injuries to treat that. And as you have talked about, there have been changes with PT and those changes in particular are earlier and more progressive physical therapy. So getting that range of motion, getting that quad function going early. I have found that, um, you know, you get that quad going, you get that motion going as early, starting as early as two days afterward, if they can meet, get, get the quad going and the motion going and meet those milestones for the rehab early, then it makes a really big difference in meeting the milestones for the rest of the rehab protocol. Right, yeah. Now, like, you know, 20, I remember 26 years ago, I'd like to just piggyback off of what we've, what we're talking about. About 26 years ago, I had gone to a course and it was interesting. It was all about knees and they put up a bunch of x-rays up there of um, what looked like very severely arthritic knees. They looked like people that were, you know, 70 to 85 years old. And they were not, they were like 45, 50 year old people who had ACL deficient knees at a younger age that never had them repaired. Now, would you say that having an ACL deficient knee puts you at high risk of arthritis if you don't have it repaired? Or is it the fact that you're at higher risk of tearing meniscus and having a torn meniscus puts you at higher risk of developing arthritis in the future? Good question. Um, I think it's the meniscus. So the ACL deficient knee, the natural history is not just instability episodes, but it's meniscus tears. And so if you go down the pathway of an unstable knee and recurrent meniscus tears over and over again, no meniscus, you end up with early arthritis. So, you know, particularly 10, 15 years ago, I was seeing just a lot of arthritic knees. You know, fortunately, I think there's more attention to, you know, meniscus preservation and uh, stabilizing the knee. And I think, I think, and I hope that we're going to see less issues with advanced arthritis in people in the 30s and 40s. Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you for answering that. Um, when patients used to tear their ACLs, it used to be pretty standard protocol to send them to therapy, you know, for four to five weeks before doing surgery. Does that practice still hold today like it did for so many years? Um, I see some fluctuation, a little bit of difference between, you know, surgeons who, who want to fix them right away and others who want to hold a little bit. What, what, what is your guideline on that? Or do you have one? I, I do. Um, I think it's still important to do prehab. So if you do an ACL surgery on a knee that's stiff, swollen, weak, poor quad function, that patient's going to fall flat on their face during the rehab. They're going to have a tough time getting that quad going, and they're going to be working on getting that motion for months. So doing the prehab, I usually recommend two to three week time frame. I usually look at the patient. So some patients come in with an isolated ACL tear, minimal trauma to the rest of the joint, no meniscus tear. They often even come in with full motion and good quad function. So they can be done, I think, anytime. But your average patient, with more trauma to the joint, who has an effusion and stiffness and achiness in that knee, I'll, I'll target two or three weeks out in most people, sometimes a little bit longer if the knee's really traumatized, but if you can get them into PT and get them the therapist to kind of help mobilize things, the soft tissues, and, and get the quad firing so that you know their knee uh, muscle memory is improved going into surgery, then again, I think they'll have a much easier time um, you know, meeting their milestones for the rehab. Now, there have been some, what initially it was thought was short-term outcomes with ACL reconstructions um, were, were um, better by doing prehab, but now they're showing it actually long-term outcomes are better with prehab. And so I'm a big advocate of getting that motion and strength back. And I tell my patients a, a minimum of 120 degrees, but if you can get all your motion back even better, you want that quad firing, you want that knee to feel normal coming into surgery or as normal as it can be. Now, we run into certain circumstances where we've got a locked knee, for example, or a situation where a multi-ligament injury, that they really can't wait. They can't really get that motion and that quad functioning and get your hands tied to doing the surgery a little bit earlier. And I do warn those patients that they may have a little more trouble meeting their milestones for the rehab, but we've got to do the surgery because the meniscus is trapped or pinched in the wrong spot, and you're not going to be able to get the prehab done. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> now. 
as far as, you know, getting patients rehabbed, you know, soon after, I think that, you know, when we talk about the prehab part of it, not only do we want to get that extension and get that quad firing, but for those of you who are, are therapists out there who see these types of patients before they have surgery, I think it's important to remember that if that knee is hot and swollen and they're still really shut down, it's not a bad idea to call the orthopedic surgeon and say, you know, I, I, I know surgery's lined up for another couple of days, but we're really having a tough time getting this, this hot knee set down um, and we've had a couple scenarios where we, we just felt like you know holding off for another couple of weeks was helpful just to get that calm down um, and I find that that's very very important the other thing that I find that's very important in regards to the prehab is that the patient develops a comfort level with what is going to be happening afterwards so they understand the expectation they have a comfort level with the therapist and when they come out of surgery I mean it's it's pretty traumatic and it's and it's you know, unnerving. And so once they can, you know, meet with the therapist and they already know they're going to be going back to see the same person, um, that can really help progress things. They have confidence in the therapist. And uh, I think that is a, a big factor in the prehab part of it also. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I, I wish more therapists would reach out, tell, tell me their patient's not ready and, you know, put off the surgery another week or two to kind of get the knee prehabbed a little bit better. Um, so I applaud you for doing that. I think it's, it's helpful for the patient care. Yeah, I think especially if a, if a patient is not very athletic and they're going to be going through this process and they, they just don't know that, that sensation of what hard work is in regards to you know, getting the leg strong and that type of thing, I think it's important to kind of prime them a little bit to, to say. Um, so after surgery, uh, we'll, we'll talk, you know, in and out of surgery here a little bit, but after surgery, it's very important to obtain full knee extension after an ACL reconstruction. Can you tell us why that is so important? Yeah, so I think the, the, the key there is to get, you know, helps with optimizing quad function and getting that full extension. I think the most important factor in doing that is that it helps with your gait. So, you need full extension to walk. Um, and so if you've got a bent knee, your gait's off, it throws off all the rehab. And so I think that's the number one reason to get that extension is, is to, to help with the gait. So that's one of the re requirements I like to be able to, re you know, minimum requirement to wean for the knee immobilizer and crutches uh, is to have a range of motion of zero to about 90 degrees and, and good quad function to kind of support that leg. And so if they've got a five or 10 degree um, the loss of extension, then I think that's something that's got to be worked on. Yeah. Now, sometimes patients, you know, end up in our office or in, in any therapy office and maybe six to eight weeks have gone by after an ACL reconstruction and they're lacking 15 degrees of extension. Are there any physical restraints there that you can see that maybe a therapist cannot work through and that may be obstructing that patient or, or hindering that patient from getting full knee extension. Yeah, I mean, I think if it's that six or eight weeks out, you, you got to be concerned a little bit about arthrofibrosis and some kind of mechanical block to it. And so with those patients, I have a low threshold of getting them a dynamic extension splint and trying to get some, some more work at home. And the PT is where a lot of work's done, but they've got to work on it 24 seven to get that that motion back and usually they're able to get it back and I think a lot of that's because they didn't get it out of the gate yeah yeah I, I, I'm, a, I'm a stickler about getting full extension unless there's you know for almost all knee patients uh, unless there's some reason you know th there's an anterior meniscal horn repair and you can't push too hard into full extension or something like that but other than that we try to extend 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 and even if it's I'd rather do that than start a heavy strengthening program and, and just get that extension motion. It seems to just make a world of difference down the road. So I always tell my patients, you know, hate me now and love me later while we're stretching them early on, uh, and rather than love me now and hate me later when they can't walk with a, with full knee extension. Yeah, no, I agree. Getting that motion, getting that swelling down, then the, then the motor function will come after. Yeah. You know? So a couple of weeks go by after surgery and the patient is starting to feel better. They're in therapy. They're starting to move. They've got 120 degrees of motion and they have full extension. The quad is starting to function well and um, they're getting off their crutches and um, they're really feeling good. But oftentimes we have to kind of slow them down for a little bit. Can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, the revascularization of that reconstruction um, and why people become, you know, a little more susceptible to re-injury at a certain time frame, and what that time frame is, in your opinion. Absolutely. So, when we do ACL surgery, 
I think people have to remember that we're harvesting a graft or sometimes we use a donor graft. In both cases, that graft is dead tissue. So as soon as you take it from, let's like, say, the patella tendon uh, or the hamstring for that matter, you know, it becomes dead tissue. So you use that as your graft. Um, and there's a process of revascularization. So during the process of growing blood vessels and incorporation of that graft or ligamentation of the graft, uh, it becomes weaker before it becomes stronger. And so with autograft, it's probably four to six weeks that it's a little bit weaker than the day of surgery. I think allograft's probably weaker, you know, probably in the six to eight week range, you know, with, with the you know, vascularization. And then it goes on to vascularize and that timeline probably will continue to get revascularized and matured and incorporated for up to two years. But if you look at the literature, with good and full functional rehab, retail rates go down dramatically at six months, and then even a little bit lower at eight months. And so um, I, I'm an eight month guy. I, I really like to hold off on the more aggressive pivoting and contact sports for eight months because I want to minimize any risk of a retail rate and of course the trauma that comes associated with that to the patient. Yeah, yeah. So, so I was going to throw this question out later, but I, you know, while we're talking about this now, it might just fit in. Um, can we talk a little bit about ligamentization? That term gets thrown around. You know, you have this tendon that you want to turn into a ligament. Any idea how long it takes for that that tissue to structurally become a ligament-like structure? Well, I think it's the same time frame. And my understanding of that is the revascularization, the incorporation, and the ligamentization ligamentization of that graft are all very similar concept and that's related to vascularization and incorporation so it's really kind of the same timeline I think it probably takes a full two years um, but honestly I think it's very mature somewhere between six and eight weeks yeah all right great thank you yeah. how often do you see uh, how often do you see meniscal tears in conjunction with ACL injuries and and how do certain types of meniscal tears affect your surgical decision making for example like a repair versus a debridement and early versus uh, early surgery versus delayed surgery are are there you know different yeah. aspects of that that uh, make you get into a surgery faster or not yeah and so i used to quote that with ACL tears, about 50% of the time, you're going to tear one or both of the meniscus. And it's quoting a study, probably an old study. Um, I did a little mini study probably three years ago of my patients, and it was actually 75% had one or both meniscus torn. So it's more common to have a meniscus injury with an ACL than an isolated ACL. Um, if it's a simple, you know, meniscus tear in the non-vascular area, those traditionally are treated by resection of that or trimming this, the flap, if you will, of that tear. Um, those are not urgent. Those can be timed when it's convenient for the patient with school, with a prehab. We talked about, you know, finding a good time to, to carve out that eight month time frame where you can spend and focus the rehab on that. And so we take care of a lot of college students who are come in for an evaluation, but they really can't do it until one of their breaks that they have and time it that kind of way. If there's a, a meniscus that in, tear that involves the vascular area, so what we call the red or the red-white zone, um, in the, the periphery, if you will, those are often repairable and usually are repairable. And we're certainly in, a, in a, a time period where we want to save that meniscus. So very aggressive about repairing those meniscus. I think those have a little different timeline. I tell the patient that, yeah, you can wait a little bit. Let's get some prehab. Let's get some motion. But you really shouldn't wait three months to do the procedure. I think that there may be a compromise to being able to repair the meniscus. And sometimes people present with, you know, a bigger tear at the time of surgery or a tear that's displaced that could have been repairable and compromise a potential long-term result by waiting too long. And then, you know, I think we talked a little bit earlier about a locked knee. So if you've got a bucket handle tear of the meniscus and you've got a piece that's flipped up in the front of the knee, I try to get those patients in the operating room within a week. I mean, you need to get that meniscus reduced and you need to get that repaired and you need the ACL reconstruction and, and get that, you know, the rehab started. Um, and so the meniscus is very important in decision and timing. Um, fortunately, we're able to repair more meniscus now than we were before. A little more aggressive with radial tear patterns and root tears in particular. So you've got to repair that root. If somebody has a root avulsion tear, uh, you've got to repair it. Otherwise, they're going to end up with very advanced arthritis at an early age. 
All right. Now, do you take age into consideration when, I mean, we used to, I remember way back when I'm dating myself now, but you know, and, an old patient was considered, you know, for ACL reconstruction was considered over 30 years old. Like right. you, were, yeah. you were getting old. Um, now, yeah. I mean, I, I just saw somebody who, hey, 61 years old who had an ACL reconstruction. And, you know, it's interesting because those people who are older who have ACL reconstructions, they seem to still do well because they're, they're you know, they're more mature. They need to get back yeah. to work. They have a, yeah. they have um, a mission. They're driven and and they get it done. And they actually do quite well. Um, but when it comes to meniscus repairs, um, does that change as you get older? Are you less likely to have a repair if you are a little bit older? When you yeah, got the there. I, I think the general answer to that is yes. And that's largely related to the to the quality of the tissue. So if you have a peripheral meniscus tear and you're in the operating room and you see that the tissue is yellow and degenerative and uh, tattered and torn, you're like, you know, this has got a 1% chance of healing if I repair it. And you're not gonna wanna put that patient through a second surgery to go resect it. And so a lot of decision-making on meniscus repairs, I think are in the operating room. Now I will still repair roots and people up to in their 60s um, if they have no arthritis in that compartment. Because if you don't restore the root, then they are going to have arthritis and those root repairs, you know, that's a repair to the bone rather than soft tissue to soft tissue. Those generally will heal in any age group. Uh, again, long as they don't have a lot of arthritis. And so I am doing some meniscus repairs, even in this patients in their sixties, but, but, you know, there's a phase out, you know, a little bit in the quality of the tissue over 40 and particularly over 50. And so you've got to kind of, have an understanding of what's going to heal and what isn't going to heal. And you don't want to, you know, want to repair something that has to require a second surgery. And so, yeah, um, yeah. But, but I do repair what I can. And I do like to repair even, you know, people who are a little bit older, as long as it's a repairable pattern with good quality tissue. Sure, sure. The knee goes through a lot of trauma when somebody tears their ACL and uh, people even get nauseous, you know, listening to stuff like this, just when we talk about it, uh, especially if they've had a tear in the past, but it, it's quite dramatic. And um, oftentimes, People, oftentimes people will have bone bruising associated with this, you know, quote unquote bone bruising. Is that something we need to be concerned with uh, in regards to future arthritis or any other secondary complications? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, you know, bone bruising is much more common than not. So if you're going to have an ACL tear, somewhere between 90 and 95 percent of those are from what's called a pivot shift. And so you have a typical lateral compartment bone bruise pattern. So you've got a bone bruise in the mid distal femur, and then the posterior tibia. Um, and so all those patients have a bone bruise. The bone bruise will heal, okay? Uh, I do not typically um, restrict weight bearing with a bone bruise because I think it's important to part of the prehab to get them functional weight bearing and walking. Now, if I see a non-displaced fracture, which I'll see sometimes, um, you know, I will kind of put them on crutches for two to four weeks. I don't think you need to put them on for six or eight weeks for that to fully heal because they're typically very stable fractures, but kind of getting a more functional prior to surgery is important. And most of these people really want to get the surgery done as soon as they can so they can start that eight month time clock for rehab. As far as long term, um, I think I'm more worried about the articular cartilage than the bone bruise. So you have to understand that with a bone bruise, there's also been an impact to the articular cartilage. Um, so we don't see a ton of articular cartilage in injuries at the time of the initial surgery, but I've had multiple patients over 20 years of practicing who have come back a year or two or five years later with arthritic changes in that lateral compartment from that initial index pivot shift. So I think it causes necrosis of the articular cartilage that sometimes doesn't manifest itself till a little bit later. Um, so, you know, again, the bone bruise, I think, will heal, and I don't make big changes or dependence on that unless there's a fracture. Yeah. All right. Thanks. I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about graft selection. Um, you know, it, it, again, you know, way back when everybody was getting, it was having a, a bone patella tendon bone um, as, as far as the, um, the graft choice. And uh, then it kind of migrated away from that. We were seeing a lot of hamstring repairs and uh, then we went, then we saw, you know, allografts and things like that. Um, how has that changed over the last several years? And are there certain graft types that work better with certain age groups or, or certain people? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. So when I trained, um, we were doing patella tendon BTB autographs on almost everybody. Um, we had a few hamstring here and there, depending on the surgeon preference. Um, 
I went in through a kind of an evolution with my practice where I started out doing a patella tendon and then kind of exploring my options when I wanted to do a hamstring on a patient who, uh, for example, kneeled for work and I wanted to kind of increase my quiver of graft choices. Then I kind of switched to hamstring because I thought there was a little bit less donor site morbidity. And then even more with the allograft. So there were some studies that came out 10, 12, 15 years ago that showed allograft was the equivalent. So I'd have conversations with patients say, we can use allograft. You're not robbing Peter to pay Paul. You're not taking your own tissue. You don't have a donor site morbidity. This is a good graft. Let's do it. Well, you found out in the youth and the more aggressive athletes that the retail rate in the allograft was really a lot higher. And so some new studies came out showing that those really aren't a good choice. Now, it was a big study that came out eight, it might even been closer to 10 years ago, where they looked at multiple sports medicine surgeons, multiple patients, and multiple grafts. Um, and the general consensus came out that bone tendon bone was a better graft, particularly for the young, under 25-year-old athletic population. And over 25, the other grafts are all very even. My take home point on that is that the if the patella tendon is a better, a lower retail rate graft uh, with the youth, then it probably is with the adults. So, you know, I'll see a 40, 45 year old martial artist who has an ACL tear. I still recommend patella tendon in those folks. Now, if we get more recreational athletes, I think the, a good choice uh, and I offer is allograft. I think it's a really good choice in somebody who's 35, 40, more recreational athlete, a little less aggressive. I think they, they have a very similar retail rate than any graft and there's, you know, less donor site morbidity with that. So I think there's still a role for that. I'm also added a lot quadriceps into my practice. Um, so that's, a, that's an up and coming graft that's becoming more and more popular. It is a big graft. It has very similar results, I think, to the patella tendon. Um, I'm using it in people who kneel. I don't want them to kneel on their scars. So if I see a roofer or a carpenter, um, you know, people do a lot of yoga, things like that. I'll say, hey, let's, let's do the quad and they're all in agreement. And that tends to be a really good, good choice on that. And it's a good revision, you know, good revision graft uh, is the quadriceps as well. The only downside in my opinion is it doesn't have a bone block on both sides. I still like a bone block. I like the, the tunnels to fill in with bone. I think there's some, some value in having those fill in with bone for later on. Yep. All right. What about uh, what about repairing a um, a native graft that may have just torn centrally? Is that something that you do? Is that uh, is that um, yeah? So, a so ACL practice? repairs. So um, what we're talking about so far on this podcast has been reconstructions where we use a graft, you know, from another source, whether it be autograph from yourself or allograph from a donor. Well, a repair is using your native ACL. So um, they did try some early repairs of the ACL and the results, this is years ago, 20 years or more, the results weren't very good, but they were repairing everything. So they were repairing all those ones that were shredded and looked like a, you know, a, the end of a mop at the time of surgery, they were repairing those and the results of course weren't, weren't good. And so there was a big shift away from repairing. Now more recently and probably eight, 10 years, there's been more interest in repairing certain patterns. So uh, it certainly represents less than 10%, probably closer to 5% of ACL tears or a clean avulsion of the ACL off the femoral origin. So you've got the graft, you've got the, the ligament intact. Uh, it's just come off the wall of the femur. And like other tendon repairs that we do around the knee or other, where, uh, other places around the body, um, you can repair it back. You can repair it right back to the femoral origin. And the results are very, very good. It's less trauma. You have to hold them back a little bit more in the first four weeks, but they meet the rest of their milestones for the rehab. And in theory, because you're repairing a vascularized ligament, you can let them return to sports earlier. And I think some people are letting them go back to activities between you know, four and six months. I will not let them go back before six months. I don't see any harm in waiting. Um, traditionally, it's done with an internal bridge. So an internal bridge, it's a two millimeter suture tape um, that has a Kevlar equivalent strength in it. And so you bridge that ACL repair with that suture tape and it protects your repair. And I think the results are even better. And so I've been very happy incorporating that in my ACL repairs. All right, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, we've, in the last couple of years, we're hearing a little bit more about this anterior lateral ligament. Um, really, to be honest with you, I'd never heard of it before until maybe two years ago. Uh, I know that there are a few surgeons out there who are are fixing this. Can you 
tell us a little bit about this, uh, this little critter and, um, you know, what does it do and uh, why don't we fix them on everybody? Yeah, good question. So ALL or anterior lateral ligament became a pretty hot topic about five or seven years ago in the orthopedic literature and the meetings and it still has value. Um, what the anterior lateral ligament is, is an extra articular peripheral rotational stabilizer on the lateral aspect of the knee. Uh, it's very similar to the ACL in preventing extra rotation about the knee, but it is peripheral rather than central. So if you look at the anatomy of the ACL, the cruciate ligaments, they're central in the knee and this is peripheral. So uh, it, you know, it has some value in having a, a stability component to the knee. Um, it was first described by Sagand, Dr. Sagand. Um, and so on a small percentage of ACL tears on a plain x-ray, we'll see what's called a Sagand fracture. Now that's an avulsion of the anterior lateral ligament. The native ALL or anterior lateral ligament is very thin and wispy. Um, and so there is consideration to doing anterior lateral ligament and to provide additional stability um, to the knee. And so I think anybody that has a really high grade pivot shift, really loose knee, we've all seen them, and they're aggressive athletes, I think there should be consideration towards doing the anterior lateral ligament. And I, in my practice, I'm mostly incorporated into revision. So there are a lot of loose knees out there that have failed one or two grafts. Everybody knows a patient that's had three or four ACLs. You gotta start thinking outside of the box and adding additional stability. And the anterior lateral ligament, I think, is an important consideration to, 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 for those particular patients. And again, most of those people have high-grade pivot shifts. Um, and so I'm doing anterolateral ligaments in those populations and revisions. I would consider them in primaries. Um, not all docs are doing it. Not all docs have uh, brought it into their arm, their quiver of uh, options, but I think it certainly plays a role uh, in, in certain patient population. Now, when we do the surgery for it, we use a graft. The native one, again, is very thin and wispy, and so we're using a graft, Priscillus, it's fairly typical to use for that. And does this usually show up in an MRI? Well, I think by nature, you're gonna tear the ALL every time you pivot shifted your knee out. So it's not really there, uh, I think, in most ACL patient knees. Yeah, okay. And it doesn't really show on an MRI very well. Yeah, okay, great, yeah. thank you. Um, so while we're talking about stability, can we talk about ACL bracing after, you know, after you've done the surgery, patients in rehab, they're getting stronger, they're getting better, they're planning on going back to playing sports or, or maybe even do high risk activities, you know, like construction where they're jumping into and out of, you know, um, a ditch or climbing the side of a house or up and down ladders and things like that. You know, do you, do you brace everybody after ACL reconstruction or are there certain people that you say, you need a brace, but you absolutely don't need one. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, and so that always comes up in conversation with almost every patient. If you look at the literature, in general, um, bracing after an ACL reconstruction has not made a difference in retear rates. Um, so there, you know, I quoted for years an old study. Another one came out about two years ago, I think. It showed the same thing. And so I don't mandate a brace in anybody. Uh, I do offer it, and there's some people who want a brace. Most insurance companies will cover a reasonable brace. Um, it may make them feel a little bit better, uh, you know, up here in the head uh, about accepting the, the, you know, I've had knee, major knee surgery, I want something on there. Um, but I, again, I don't, I don't mandate a brace. I think that um, it's a good idea to use braces in certain revision situations, if not most of them. Uh, multi-ligament injuries, um, and then I've used them, uh, you know, for return to work for people. I think if you've got somebody who's a physical laborer, it's a tough nut for them to be out of work for six months or more for an ACL surgery, and so we're trying to find somewhere meeting in the middle at three, three, sometimes four months post-operative returning to physical labor, moderating the work you do a little bit, but also putting a brace on there. And, and uh, I think it works. I think it really helps them get back to work a little bit easier and provide some protection while that graft is still maturing. I have found in my practice that there are certain patients that want a brace and those tend to be the skiers. That's also a sport where the brace doesn't really bother you to wear it. And so it doesn't bump the other knee much, doesn't li limit you to wear the brace, where if you try to brace uh, you know, a younger basketball player, they're going to wear that brace for one practice and they're going to put it aside and they won't wear it anymore. And so I think, you know, 
I do, I'm a little bit sports specific in returning to braces if patients, you know, fitting with braces if people want them. Great, thank you. Um, you know, we, we, we could talk about ACLs all day long, uh, but in the effort of trying to keep this, you know, kind of timely, um, I'd like to ask, is there anything that you would like to tell our listeners uh, in regards to ACLs, ACL reconstruction, rehab, or anything like that, that you feel would be a pearl that um, could be helpful? Yeah, I mean, I think the pearls here, and we talked about a, a bunch of different things here. We covered a lot of ground here. Um, I don't know how you can go all day talking about ACLs, but I guess you probably could, right? <laughs> yeah, especially um, the rehab part of it. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that's important here is an early diagnosis. And we all know patients that have been misdiagnosed or not diagnosed that have had an ACL deficient knee and with meniscus tears. And so, so getting an early diagnosis is important. Early range of motion and prehab, if they're going, particularly if they're going through surgery. Subspecialty care, if possible. There are a lot of decisions making with ACL tears. It's not just putting a graft in. There's a lot of things that go into to making the appropriate recommendations and what we do as, uh, as ACL surgeons. And again, stabilization in most cases. I mean, I've taken care of people that really aren't athletes. You know, they, they have an unstable knee. Their knee's shifting out when they're walking on gravel or they turn suddenly in the kitchen and their knee pivots out. And there are a lot of people out there who want a stable knee for quality of life. And so, you know, I, I think that that's something to, to pay attention to. And you know, focus on a progressive rehabilitation. I think you guys, as physical therapists, play a huge role in outcomes with PT, I mean, I'm sorry, with ACL reconstruction. So I thank you all that do that fine work of getting those patients back up to, to speed after their surgery and before. And then I think another pearl is waiting eight months. So I, I, I think, you know, there's pat the patients out there, we've all seen it. They're pushing to get back. They, they have it on their calendar when that six month point is up to the day. And, uh, and I think that new recommendation should be eight months. Um, I think it's worth the time. I had the same conversation with somebody earlier today about that. It's just, it's worth it, you know, and you don't want to go through another surgery. You don't want to go through a revision. So I think that's a big pearl is just that these patients have to understand, they have to have expectations that it's going to take a long time. Yeah, absolutely. I remember way back when I first started doing therapy, it was a year and we had excellent outcomes. We had very low failure rates and um, uh, great success with patients. And then we got into these accelerated programs and, and people in the NFL were getting back to playing in three or four months and you know, getting in trouble. And then we saw these failure rates go up and then it's all kind of coming back around where we're, you know, looking at giving them just a little more time to heal. And it doesn't matter really who you are. You still have to heal. Um, you can be strong. You can, you know, you can have great fixation, but that tissue has to become good, healthy, viable tissue that has to be able to, to stabilize you. So we're starting to become much more uh, patient with people and trying to instill that in our patients um, to hang on and, and to, you know, not go and blow this thing. And then you're out another year. Yeah. You can't change the biology. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Dr. Hoffman, thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate you being with me. Um, if if somebody wanted to get in touch with you, and I, and I asked the listeners to be, you know, respectful of this, if somebody wanted to get in touch with you, had a question, uh, uh, you know, a reasonable question, how could they get in touch with you? Now, I, I get questions all the time through my YouTube channel and from my podcast show, and, and it's not, most of them, 99% of them are great questions. But oftentimes, I'll get crazy things like, where did you get that shirt? That's the ugliest shirt I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> you know? um, but in respect to, you know, you're busy. Yeah, and 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 you're you know going all the time, and we respect that, and and we we thank you for the good work that you do. But as a listener, if you have a question for Dr. Hoffman, make sure that it's it's to the point, and it's and it's um it's a good question. And Dr. Hoffman, if somebody wants to get in touch with you, uh, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, I think the best way they can certainly contact you, and you can contact me if they forget, you know, the way to do it. Um, my email, uh, now I do have a spam filter like everybody else, but I do go through the, 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 the list, if you will, of, of ones that are sent to that. But uh, so my email is probably the best way and that's E Hoffman. So that's E H O F F M A N at spectrum H C P.com. That stands for healthcare partners, spectrum H C P.com. 
I can add that to the show notes of uh, this uh, podcast and uh, this is going to be on YouTube also. So it'll be in the show notes of the YouTube um, channel. So you can, you can get it there, but you know, feel free to get in touch with me and I can get in touch with Dr. Hoffman for you uh, and, and help answer any of the questions that uh, anybody has out there. Um, I would like to thank everybody for listening today. I, I hope that we were able to give you a few tidbits of information that you can take back to your clinic and use the next time, you know, when you evaluate and when you treat your patients, I think that it's important that we, talk to our patients, give them expectations. And when you can load your toolbox with a lot of knowledge, um, you can really uh, build that comfort level up. So your patients feel more comfortable in, in what you're talking about and that what you're talking about is factual and, and through experience, like with Dr. Hoffman and myself, that's about 300 years of experience. Um, and we can, <laughs> <laughs> we, we can, we can tell you what, what it's been like. We've seen thousands of ACLs and we know what the outcomes are like. It's not like it's some, something that's new to us uh, so we can really help guide you and uh, and hopefully you got a little information today that will be helpful um, make sure you check out the links in the show notes today uh, all the great information on how to get in onto our website uh, get our information how to get to our youtube channel that's all right there at the click of a button and um, you know hopefully we can make evaluating orthopedic injuries and managing orthopedic injuries easier. Um, if you could also please go to our uh, podcast, uh, you know, station, anything like Apple Podcasts or Spotify, anywhere where you listen to uh, podcasts and leave a rating and review that really helps with our ratings. And uh, make sure that you stay tuned for next week's episode where we are going to be talking about all kinds of other orthopedic stuff. Send me your questions. I'll answer them on the show for you and uh, I'll be more than happy to do some research and and, and take care of those topics for you. So again, we are in challenging times right now dealing with this COVID-19 virus. And uh, I, I hope that everybody stays safe and, uh, and healthy. And uh, please, you know, take care of yourself, take care of your patients and, um, and, and God bless. And uh, Dr. Hoffman, thank you so much for being on the show today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right, folks. Take care and until uh, next time.